In Ontario, we are blessed with a wealth of fish and wildlife resources that enhance and enrich the lives of all residents, both those that hunt and fish and those that do not. As executive director of the OFH and a passionate lifelong angler and hunter, I am so grateful for the fishing and hunting experiences that I have enjoyed. The history of the North American wildlife conservation model is truly inspiring, as told here in this video by one of the foremost authorities on the subject, fellow Canadian Shane Mahoney. Shane is a scientist, passionate hunter, ardent conservationist and friend. Watch and listen to Shane's fascinating account of the development of the wildlife conservation movement in North America. You will learn about, as I am sure you will appreciate, the pivotal role that anglers and hunters like you and I have played in this achievement. You will also gain an appreciation as I have for the responsibility that we all share in continuing the work of those that came before us. Your membership in a conservation organization like the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters is a demonstration of your commitment to sound wildlife management and support for the continued recognition of the strength of our fishing, hunting and conservation heritage. I invite you to enjoy and learn from this fascinating story of our history and feel the pride that I do each and every time I view this video. A special thanks goes out to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for allowing us to bring you this presentation. Now sit back and enjoy. It's my pleasure to bring you the history of the North American wildlife conservation model. If you're as passionate about hunting as I am, the sounds of those hunting horns from Europe must stir something in your soul. Something proud and sure, something primitive, something that remains important in your life. I'm Shane Mahoney. I'm a biologist, a researcher, and somebody who cares deeply about wildlife. And I have spent the last 10 years of my life lecturing extensively about the importance of the North American model of wildlife conservation. This model of conservation, simply put, is the best single effort to conserve and manage wildlife in perpetuity that the world has ever seen. begun 150 years ago, and primarily founded, funded, and supported by hunters and anglers throughout North America. This model today is responsible for the extraordinary diversity of wildlife that we see on this continent. While there were others who contributed and must be recognized, it remains fundamentally true that it is the man with the gun and the man with the rod that has substantively supported and rescued wildlife in North America. This model today is healthy and vibrant because of the people who founded it and because of the people who continue to support it. And over the next little while, I'm going to help explain exactly what this model is and to ask you, as a hunter and angler, to become part of it, to become energized even more than you have been, even more than you are, for the protection, for the conservation of wildlife and for the preservation of our cherished traditions of hunting and angling. It's hard to imagine, I suppose, but 125 to 140 years ago, it was already becoming apparent to some people that the vast animal resources and wealth of the North American continent was under siege. The taming and quotation marks of the continent by European settlers had led them to extract from the land, obviously, as much as they possibly could. And there was a feeling that the resources of the New World were limitless. It became clear, however, after a relatively short period of just a couple of centuries, that this was not true. Even on this vast landscape, from the Pacific to the Atlantic, from the North to the South, it was capable for men to withdraw from the land too much. What emerged in the period of time from about the 1820s to about the 1860s or so was a revolution in the way the world and certainly a revolution in the way North Americans viewed wildlife. There began a movement which largely was based on the hunter conservationists of North America 
that said we must step back, take a different tact, and begin to bring about a revolution in how we treat wildlife and how we treat the wild habitats that wildlife depends upon. It was not only the landscapes of power, those high mountain peaks and cascading waterfalls that hunters wanted to protect and preserve. Hunters and anglers were amongst the first to recognize that it was a diversity of wildlife habitats that was required to preserve not only the species they love to pursue, but also all wildlife species. This is one of the things that's not well understood about the conservation movement that was launched by hunters and anglers. The benefits extended to all wildlife species, not just to those that were pursued in those founding traditions. We may wonder about what it was that led these groups of people, these hunters and fishermen, to believe that they could turn the tide of commercial exploitation of wildlife species. We have to remember that at this time, in the mid-19th century and into its latter decades, that there were no game laws, or very few. There were no federal, state, or provincial agencies dedicated to the conservation of wildlife and fish. There were, in fact, very few, if any, game wardens of any kind, anywhere. There were no university programs that were turning out students who were well-schooled in these issues and in these policies and in this science. In fact, none of the infrastructure, none of the framework whatsoever that we today take for granted, that we believe is essential to the conservation of wildlife, uh, existed. And yet these individuals, driven essentially by a passion for wild creatures, a passion for wild country, and an extraordinary passion and love for the activities of hunting and fishing, they managed to launch a reformation a revolution in the way we approached wildlife. Some of the writings that spurred this kind of thought development in the United States arose as a result of British aristocrats who came to the United States to live. One in particular, William Herbert, who was in fact uh, a British aristocrat who moved to the United States in 1831 and who began to write about the uh, tradition of fair chase and the tradition of the aristocratic landholder hunter of Europe. The Europeans who settled North America carried with them the long-standing hunting traditions of their home countries. Some of those traditions would be cast aside, most notably the aristocracy stranglehold on the means and privilege to hunt at all. But one key element of old world hunting emerged as a viable foundation in the New World model the notions of humans as stewards of the animals they hunted. The North American wildlife conservation model is appropriately called a model because it is based on discernible components, all related and all transferable between regions and generations. There are seven primary components to the model, all of them as valuable now as they were during their formation, all of them critical as we move forward here in the 21st century. Since Roman times, wildlife has been the subject of legal debate, and the questions of ownership and access have been particularly intense. In colonial North America, citizens considered unbridled access to resources of their new Eden as a sacred right, and one they held up in contrast to the European system, where often only the wealthy had access to such treasures as wildlife. Today, this doctrine of public trust is enshrined in North American law, enabling continental approaches to wildlife conservation and empowering the citizenry to engage in both wildlife use and protection. Commerce in dead wildlife was a huge business in the latter half of the 1800s, and market hunters and restaurateurs were keenly interested in having it remain so. The scale of this industry was such that all wildlife of any economic value was threatened, regardless of their numbers. Systematic commercial exploitation drove to extinction or severely depleted species as diverse as bison, egrets, passenger pigeons, and elk. <laughs> 
Eliminating through legislation the trafficking in dead wildlife saved many species and restored populations to levels where managed harvests and other uses were possible. Despite the drive to eliminate wildlife markets, there was no intention to eliminate wildlife use. The question was how best to allocate it. The clear and obvious answer was by law. This not only safeguarded against the rise of special elites who would appropriate wildlife to themselves, a return to a hated European tradition, it also democratized an involvement with nature. Now, through the courts when necessary, all citizens could participate in developing systems of wildlife conservation and use. Every citizen had right of access by law, and by law, every citizen had right of say. Wildlife was firmly in the cradle of democracy. It is not surprising that the model directly addressed the issue of hunting. After all, hunters and anglers, more than any other group, led the crusade for wildlife and openly articulated their interest in maintaining it for a variety of personal reasons, including the opportunities to hunt and fish. Today, in Canada and the United States, we take for granted that every man and woman has the equal opportunity under the law to participate in these activities. But it need not have been so. Alternative models exist around the world where class and land ownership decide, to a large extent, who has the right and privilege to hunt. Today, hunting remains a deep-rooted tradition in North America and is fundamental to the conservation of all wildlife species and their habitats. Although laws could govern access to wildlife and ensure that all citizens had a say in its protection, there had to be guidelines as to appropriate use. This was eventually defined to mean killing for food and fur, self-defense and property protection. Although these categories have been broadly interpreted, they are sufficiently restrictive to safeguard against the kind of wanton destruction that saw hundreds of thousands of birds slaughtered every year for feathers to festoon women's hats. The boundaries of states and nations are of little relevance to wildlife and fish, and the policies and laws for wildlife conservation had to address this reality. The 1911 Fur Seal Treaty and the famous and famously effective Migratory Bird Protection Act of 1916 are excellent examples of international cooperation. In addition, of course, more regional agreements have been ubiquitous in the North American model, allowing states and provinces to coordinate and cooperate in their efforts for wildlife and for regulating hunting and angling activities. Interest in science and natural history was deeply ingrained in North American society, a fact reflected in the emphasis placed on recording wildlife habitats and diversity by almost every major expedition charged with mapping the continent. Furthermore, hunters and anglers were by habit and inclination naturalists. It was not surprising, therefore, that very early in the model's formulation, science was identified as a crucial requirement. This policy eventually gave rise to the core of trained wildlife professionals who now manage, under law, the continent's wild resources. We call these seven pillars of the North American wildlife conservation model the Seven Sisters. They did not emerge all at once, and nor was any individual or group entirely responsible for developing them. But gradually they emerged from the impassioned debate of how best to protect our wildlife heritage. You may not remember all of them, but collectively they have given us our great natural treasures here in North America, making what might have been lost long ago an enduring legacy in the United States and Canada. This idea of a kind of class of hunter who not just killed for the pot and certainly did not kill for commercial reasons began to resonate to some extent in the American psyche. It was found to be attractive. At the same time, there was rising, uh, particularly in post-Civil War uh, America, 
group of people, particularly in the East, who began to feel that part of what was to become their citizenship, part of their responsibility, was to make sure that the wildlife abundance of America was not lost. And it was a strange combination of this citizen activism and this looking back to some of the European traditions that eventually gave rise to a new approach to hunting and angling and to a new approach to wildlife conservation, which today we recognize as the North American model. The movement to establish this new tradition was evidenced by the appearance of a large number of journals, publications that emerged in the period between about 1871 and 1881. The rise of these journals, such as American Sportsman, Forest and Stream, Field and Stream, American Angler, presented the opportunity for those who felt passionate about these traditions of hunting and angling to share their views, to share their experiences afield, and also to share their concerns for the future of wildlife and fish populations, and also for the future of their cherished traditions. Eventually, this rising awareness on the part of hunters and anglers themselves about the status of wildlife and fish populations and the appeals that they were making through their many clubs and organizations began to formulate into a political movement. It's astounding, in fact, to think of the, the fact that by the time of Custer's defeat at the Little Bighorn, uh, there were something in excess of 500 uh, conservation organizations, fishing and hunting clubs, etc already established in the United States, uh, composed of individuals in some cases of, of means and in other cases of individuals who were of very modest incomes and capacities in that regard, uh, these clubs and fraternities began to lobby uh, for laws and for policies, legislation, and for resources to in fact manage wildlife populations, safeguard wildlife populations, protect them and at the same time to ensure the preservation of the traditions of hunting and angling. In Canada and the United States, it was possible to dream of such developments, a situation where all the citizenry could help fashion wildlife policy and hope to have their views enshrined in law. The citizen activism allowed for a vision of conservation that would be distinctively new world in its character and design a continental policy framework of enduring significance. Henry David Thoreau once said, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. Now put foundations under them. Foundations are under the North American model of wildlife conservation important legislation that was passed to ensure that the model succeeded. Foremost amongst these was the 1842 Supreme Court decision that said that fishermen in New Jersey could have access to oysters over the protest of a landowner who was granted the land by Charles II of England. The landowner felt that because of the permit that he had that he could prevent access to these resources. The Supreme Court decision, however, in the United States was that these resources belong to all the people and thus established the public trust doctrine which is so fundamental to the conservation of wildlife resources on this continent. This legislation was followed in 1900 by another seminal piece, the Lacey Act, which forbade the transportation of wildlife taken illegally in one jurisdiction from being moved to another one. That legislation was followed in 1918 by the famous Migratory Bird Convention and Act, which of course recognized wildlife as an international resource, again one of the crucial founding principles of the North American model. There followed thereafter, in 1934, the establishment of the Duck Stamp, in 1937, the passing of the Pittman-Robertson Act, and then in 1950, the Dingle-Johnson Act, all three of which formed the financial foundation and support for the North American model. The rightly famous Pittman-Robertson Act placed an excise tax on guns and ammunition sold to hunters, 
with the proceeds being distributed for conservation programs throughout the United States. The Dingle Johnson Act did a similar thing for fishing equipment sold to anglers. While these funds are derived from hunting and angling enthusiasts, the wildlife programs they help support include a wide variety of species, and the habitats that are protected benefit game, non-game, and endangered species alike. Indeed, the exciting recent rediscovery of the ivory-billed woodpecker, thought extinct for 60 years in the Cache River National Wildlife Refuge in eastern Arkansas, illustrates this point very well. The hardwood swamp habitat where this magnificent species now resides was purchased in part using funds obtained through the Hunter Duck Stamp Program. Since the inception of these acts, hunters and anglers have provided seven and a half billion dollars in support for conservation programs. What other group in society can lay claim to this? The North American model may have been developed initially to protect wildlife resources, but it's doing a very good job as well of protecting local economies and local communities. After all, the $70 billion spent annually by hunters and anglers creates 1.5 million jobs, most of them in rural America. Other wildlife activities, such as bird watching, nature photography, and outdoor adventuring, also contribute enormously to the nation's economy. And all of these activities have been enhanced by the conservation efforts that hunters and anglers have directly funded. But the beginnings of this, the beginnings of this entire conservation movement, including the preservation of national parks and historic monuments and so on, had its roots in the foment, in the debate, and in the discussions that were essentially launched by the hunters and anglers of the United States and Canada. This is a lesson that uh, we should not forget, and it is also a lesson that we should make every attempt that we can to share with the rest of the public, not only with the public who are hunters and fishermen, but also to the public at large. Between the groups and the individuals of all walks of life who participated in the conservation movement, of course it is always possible to find those who stood out above the rest. Individuals in these ranks include people like uh, George Bird Grinnell, uh, who was the founder of the Audubon Society, uh, was uh, the editor of Forest and Stream, a man who very early in his life developed a keen interest in ornithology. Uh, but was also a first-rate naturalist in a broad sense, uh, accompanied Custer to the Black Hills in 74, uh, was a man uh, who befriended and highly influenced uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, a man also who called for the first time for the end completely of the commercialization uh, of wildlife, and who also argued that uh, enforcement of wildlife regulations should be funded by hunters themselves. He was a man who influenced uh, not only Roosevelt, uh, he also influenced uh, Gimford Pinchot, the man who became the, uh, the head of the U.S. Forest Service, and a man who himself lobbied relentlessly for conservation programs in the United States and developed, along with Roosevelt and Grinnell, this important idea of wise use of natural resources, where resources should not be locked away, but should in fact be used for the benefit of mankind and for societies, but in a sustainable way. And then, of course, we had uh, Theodore Roosevelt himself, uh, the man who became president, uh, the man who believed so fundamentally in the, in the right of every individual in society to have access to wildlife, to have the opportunity to hunt and fish, who believed that the exercise of these traditions uh, produced in people the best traits, uh, the man who set aside such vast areas uh, in national forests, in wildlife refuges, in national parks, and so on and so forth, and a man whom it was said uh, didn't only represent America, but in fact was America at the time of his presidency. All three of those core individuals that played such crucial roles, particularly in the latter part of the 1800s, uh, interestingly enough, were themselves strongly influenced by a predecessor, an individual by the name of George Perkins Marsh, who in 1864 published a book that was not expected to have much of an impact called Man and Nature. Uh, 
he articulated in this crucial book, which is still read 140 years after its publication, that if men were knowledgeable about the future, if they knew that the impacts of their efforts would be such that resources would be depleted and then there would be effects that would be felt by human society, he believed that men would adopt a different position. And out of vested self-interest, they would then work to preserve those natural resources and to use them wisely. And this, of course, this notion of wise use and a vested interest protecting its own long-term survival by ensuring that resources are there in perpetuity to be used is absolutely a cornerstone of the North American conservation model. And essentially, if we look back on this history, we may identify the, the bold actions of a President Roosevelt. We may look at the untiring efforts of somebody like George Bird Grinnell for the conservation of all wildlife, including non-game, as he called it, when he started the Audubon Society for Birds, or Gifford Pinchot, who fought relentlessly for wise use of the forests. We see that there is this thread that ties itself back to George Perkins Marsh. The hunter-led wise use movement also recognized the value of wilderness. And hunters and non-hunters alike supported the preservation of our wildest places, an effort that has become a cornerstone in North American conservation. John Muir, a non-hunter and the most famous wilderness proponent of all time, had articulated a vision of sacredness and spiritual enlightenment through the experience of wild places that was and still is shared by many hunters. As the famous photograph of John Muir and Theodore Roosevelt in the Yosemite region attests, on the matter of wilderness, a wide range of personalities could agree. Indeed, one of the hallmarks of the North American conservation model was its democratic profile and inclusiveness. This unique pedigree empowered all citizens to enroll their particular views and personal passions in one embracing program of conservation principles. Together these would found the North American model and become this continent's unique and enduring contribution to conserving both the animal diversity of the planet and the cultural diversity of human society and traditions. Perhaps it was this inclusiveness more than any other characteristic which helps explain why the North American model has persisted for so long and why throughout its history it has thrown up individuals who made such outstanding contributions. As the original founders of the model passed on, Roosevelt, Grinnell, Pinchot, and Muir, others arose to make their mark on its history and to help guide its passage through the 20th century. In Canada, despite its being a loyal colony of Britain, individuals emerged to embrace these conservation principles and render the approach a truly North American plan. Early in the 20th century, men such as Sir Clifford Sifton and Gordon Hewitt played crucial roles respectively in developing wise use approaches to forestry and in drafting the Migratory Bird Protection Act, while Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier sanctioned a host of other Canadian conservation initiatives. Later, in the 1930s, a new core of conservation leaders emerged. Ding Darling was one such individual, appointed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt as Chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey. This newspaper man and political cartoonist was an ardent campaigner for waterfowl conservation and in fact designed the first migratory bird hunting stamp. He was also a visionary who recognized that professionals were required to ensure effective wildlife research, management and administration. His drive to find resources for these programs led to one of the most momentous meetings in conservation history. On April 24, 1934, Darling brought together a series of prominent businessmen and other conservation supporters at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. From the discussions that evening arose the Cooperative Wildlife Unit Research Program, the National Wildlife Federation, the North American Wildlife Management Institute, and the North American Wildlife and Natural Resources Conference. The collective impact on conservation of these initiatives, all of which are still ongoing, is almost incalculable.
A second individual from the 20th century who was to have enduring influence on North American conservation was Aldo Leopold. After working for several years for the U.S. Forest Service, Leopold was to undertake a first-of-its-kind intensive investigation of wildlife populations in the northern Midwest United States. This research would lead in 1933 to the publication of his seminal work, Game Management, which revolutionized wildlife management in North America and many other parts of the world. In that same year, he became the first ever professor of game management, accepting a position at the University of Wisconsin. With his appointment and ongoing efforts, a new profession was launched ensuring that science would form the basis of wildlife management and restoration in North America. Perhaps more than anything else, however, Leopold is remembered and admired for his understanding of the intricate beauty and complex interrelatedness of all life forms. His philosophical writings on the value of all species and the role of human intervention and our relationship with the natural world were captured in the enduring classic, A Sand County Almanac, which is still read and admired today. A keen hunter and naturalist, Leopold seemed more capable than anyone before or since in his capacity to reach all students and lovers of nature, hunters and non-hunters alike. In this regard, he perhaps best exemplifies the inclusive tradition of the North American conservation model and remains a powerful example for those who wish to make their own contribution to wildlife conservation. These individuals and many others who followed them contributed enormously to the success and the furtherance of the North American approach to conservation. But what is fundamentally important is for individual hunters and anglers to understand that there were legions in support of this movement. It was not only the few well-remembered names, it was the individual angler and hunter who committed himself and herself to best practices to support at the local political level to make sure that wildlife was maintained in perpetuity that land and habitat were preserved, that there were funding mechanisms in place to ensure that conservation programs could be realized. This history tells us that individuals can make a difference, and it is crucial that every citizen, and not just hunters and anglers, not only pursue their traditions in the outdoors which they so love, but also become engaged personally and directly and the conservation programs and opportunities around them. My purpose in reviewing the North American wildlife conservation model with you is to emphasize that wildlife does not exist by accident. All of this bounty and opportunity that we share came to us through the efforts of individuals, many of them unnamed, it is true, but they are all heroes. They all contributed, and they all allowed for generations unborn at their time to share in these magnificent traditions which we still maintain today. Much has changed since the days of Roosevelt and Grinnell, since the days of the endless herds of bison. More and more of the land has been developed and fractured, and wildlife is increasingly threatened by our own demands for space and natural resources. What has not changed, however, is our responsibility towards wildlife, to our countries, and to the generations that will come after us. For the North American model is as much about citizenship as it is about conserving wildlife. The baton has been passed to our hands, and we must not fail. The image of Canada and the United States as nations without abundant wildlife and wild places can never become acceptable. For to lose these and the treasured traditions they empower will be to lose a sacred and irreplaceable part of ourselves. It is in our collective efforts in a true conservation partnership of equals, that we will secure a future for wildlife on this continent. And in doing so, we will remain true to the legacy of the North American model.